everyone, and welcome to another enlightening episode of SolarWinds Tech Pod. I'm your host, Sean Sebring, joined by my brilliant co-host, Crystal Taylor. For this episode, we'll discuss the strategy, implementation, and design of AI ops with our very own well-qualified Derek Daly. Uh, Derek is a principal product manager for AI ops, or at least he was. Can you tell us a little bit more about your career leading up to this and maybe what you've moved to now? Yeah, thanks, uh, Sean and Crystal, for having me on today. So yeah, I'm a AI Ops PM in SolarWinds for the last two years. Started off my career in SolarWinds as a sales engineer um, and then had multiple different iterations through the sales engineering organization or solutions engineering organization. Previous to SolarWinds, I was stuck in the network world as well, but in the telecom sphere. So I was working with their OSS and BSS. So essentially your Orion for telecoms. As soon as I saw Orion and I played around with the demo for my actual interview, I was like, oh my God, I know how to talk about this immediately. It's so easy to use. It looks so nice. It's I just couldn't get over it compared to the beasts of software that I was used to in the telecoms world. So started as a, a network focused engineer, but through a bit of graft and timing and luck, I got to get stuck into other sides of our portfolio. So was more or less able to demonstrate pretty much every product we had up until we have ITSM. That's one I know absolutely nothing about. And then I kind of started studying machine learning. I was like, what can I learn about this and how can I apply this to Solomon's? I was always kind of looking at it from a lens of how can we use machine learning to improve what we have in Orion? So anyway, I used to talk a lot to product leadership, you know, talk, give feedback also from a coaching perspective. And one of our leaders at the time, VP of product, you know, who I kind of gone pretty close to, was aware that I was keen on product, but I kind of mentioned in passing that I was studying machine learning. He was like, great, how are you finding? And I talked a bit about it. About four or five months later, uh, my pass rings me, says, um, there's someone here called Colin who wants to talk to you about a, a role in product. I said, look, I'll have a conversation with this person. Um, they were eager to get someone to run the AI ops side of the product side of things. And, you know, I spoke with this person and the vision I was sold was, was incredible. But also as a, as an engineer, I really understand the customer needs. And if I can get into a role in PM where I'm actually setting the strategy and deciding what features we build, I really think I can add a lot of value to customers. Again, I was very happy in the old role and I wasn't trying to ditch it. I wasn't trying to jump from it because I really loved that role, but it was just too good an opportunity to say no to. So I said yes to it. Uh, I took my sabbatical in July and I came back as a PM. So it was a, a good transition. So that's how I got to where I am today. And here you are. I feel like it does make the most sense as like a natural exchange from an SE over to PM that happens more often than I would have thought. You know, like you said, I love that you take that tangible, actionable use cases, feedback from all the customers. And they're so close because as a SE still, like solution engineer, Still, I have to build and maintain the closest relationships with my PM to feel like the product's going where I know my customers want it to go. Um, I have to explain to my leadership why I moved to PM next, it sounds like. I think that was a very clear example, too, of like all of the things we're always talking about, how important networking is and how important it is to maintain your education as you're continuing forward and all of those things. Like you're such a good example of all that. It's always exciting to talk to you because you're also like just so passionate about working with the products and with the customers. And I don't think that should be taken lightly. We hear it all the time, trade shows. I mean, you guys are SEs or were SEs and I've never been an SE, but I did work for a partner and I worked with lots of customers and listening to their feedback and like what they're using everything for and what they see as more important is always like super interesting. So it's nice to like re-meet you. You have been with SolarWinds for how long, Derek? 11 years. 11 years, that's awesome. Um, and so how long has, because if it was just two years for you as far as like taking over um, AI ops in the product portfolio, how long has SolarWinds been adding AI, ML, and you can separate them if you want to answer that question into the portfolio? Yeah, so it's important to outline what the words mean and what the phrases mean. So AI is artificial intelligence, and that is using computers to fulfill anything a human can do. So AI in essence is, is and has been around us for a long, long time. Machine learning is a subset of AI, and that is where a machine using some form of mathematical equation or algorithm is identifying patterns and trends, and then using those 
to make decisions in the future. It's technically learning. It's identifying things and being able to use that to make decisions in the future. AI ops then is, is a subset of AI, but then some elements of it are not machine learning based, right? So AI ops does not necessarily always equate to machine learning. You know, when you're building products and when you're trying to deliver features to a customer, the very base point is understanding a problem. What is the problem the customer is facing? Maybe it's a problem that they don't know they have right now. Spoken like a true solution engineer right there. <laughs> I can't walk away from my heritage as an SE. Um, but yeah, so like it's identifying the problem, be it something that they're aware of or not aware of. Okay. Then when we try and come up with a solution, it's always best to keep the solution as simple as possible. So if you can do something, if you can solve a problem with uh, inbuilt logic or some very, very simple mathematics, then it's absolutely the way to go. It's faster. Uh, the cost to host it for a customer perspective or for a SaaS perspective is going to be lower. So your, your total cost of ownership is lower. The performance is typically better and it solves the problem. Now, if whatever problem you're trying to solve cannot be easily solved with inbuilt logic, then that's where you start to think about AI ops and in particular machine learning. An example of that would be something that is seasonal, for instance. So you can easily get an understanding of what the average metric value was for CPU for the last week. And you can very easily use that to somewhat forecast somewhat accurately for the next week or so. But that doesn't take into account that every three weeks that payroll is super busy. So all the systems that they use are going to have a spike. It doesn't take into account, you know, the tech pod that's running, you know, once a month. It doesn't take into account the stuff that isn't as daily or weekly, right? So that's the things you need to take into consideration when you're trying to solve a problem. Like AI ops, machine learning is not always the best solution. And to be fair to SoloWinds and something that I think is actually we should be proud of is that we haven't just thrown machine learning all over the place just to stick a machine learning banner on it. And also, we've been doing AI ops for 10 years. We've had machine learning in our products for five, six, seven years for longer than a lot of software vendors out there. But we haven't just blown our trumpet about it and said, oh, look at us, we're using machine learning, we're great. You know, we're out there to solve real problems and it doesn't matter to the customer how we solve them. If we solve the problem, they're happy. We don't have to stick a big machine learning banner on it and say, look, this is really cool. It's AI, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, um, it's really, it sounds like it's really important to make purposeful choices and where you use the AI and machine learning are tools just like any other. So if you are using them in the wrong place and they're not going to do everything that you hope for and they might in, in fact be harmful to the end goal that you're trying to achieve. You mentioned several things there, and I, all I could think about was dynamic baselines in uh, in the Orion platform. You were describing kind of the alerting, like it doesn't account for certain things because those are designed to, over the last seven or 15 days, to set a baseline based on performance over that time period. So it only takes into account things that happen during that time period. And it's a lot less intuitive and can't learn over time because you have to reset a time window for it to use for the baseline if you want to reset that baseline. So I just remember when it came out and it was just like mind blowing. Like before you had to have all manual baselines and tell it when things were not normal. And that was already like a big step in the next direction of let's figure out how we can reduce the amount of time it takes to kind of maintain all of this and figure out when things are going awry and what things are outside the normal operating procedures. And I think that was really interesting that watching this kind of journey, I mean, I've been working with the SolarWinds products for about 13 years and kind of the same thing. You watch the journey of it go from like very uh, manual and it was very easy to use. I agree with you on that. You were describing your journey earlier and I worked in retail and then I got into working with SolarWinds software and I had no problem. So I agree. It's super easy to use and that was super helpful. But watching it kind of go from monitoring things on a very manual basis, you have to go and say, these are the things that you're doing these are the things I care about, these specific things. Instead of doing that, we moved into additional kind of ways, right? The dynamic baselines. And then we added recommendations and certain things like the virtualization recommendation engine was added. And like just watching it kind of evolve over the years. And you can clearly see where AI and machine learning have come into play a little bit as time went by. And now we're just jumping in a little bit more in those kind of same spaces, actually. 
Yeah, like when the recommendations came out, like, wow, as a feature, it was just incredible to demo. Customers absolutely loved it. It solved unbelievably complex problems in a really easy manner. Even today, I love the feature. I just love how it looks and it's so powerful. You know, one of the drawbacks to it, which we know it doesn't take into account seasonality. Other than that, it's it's a phenomenal tool and like it's been there for many, many years. We didn't charge any extra for it. You know, I thought just a, just a really, really neat feature. I have a very ignorant question for an appropriate audience, which I feel like I do on every episode. So maybe I'm just an ignorant person, but I like to get experts' opinions on definitions, like the meaning of something. Of course, observability is one that's been out for a while, but in your case, Derek, I was going to ask you to give us a definition of AI ops. And it doesn't have to be SolarWinds definition. It can be your thought leadership. And maybe SolarWinds happens to perfectly align with the way you would describe it. But what is AI ops? What does that mean to you? What is AI ops? So if we just break it apart, it is uh, artificial intelligence for IT operations. You know, observability in its own right is a form of AI ops because it's computers who are consuming, ingesting all of this data and presenting it in a way that makes it easier for you to either find the root cause of an issue, but essentially to make a business decision. Your end goal is is the business use case, right? Anything, in my opinion, that's able to ingest different types of data over different periods of time and to give you a unified view on it, that is the type of insights that helps you run your operation. There's so much data out there. I mean, I don't remember the exact figure, but I do remember there's a study done about how much data we produce as a whole and how it's growing exponentially like day over day at this point, because there's no possible way for anyone human being to consume even a fraction of it. So the fact that we're using computers to help process that data and help us make decisions is only really the next step because we can't possibly do it ourselves. I'm excited about using the technology that we have, using the tools that we have to further our goals and to help people kind of process things so they can make decisions more quickly, right? If you have to use a human to process all the data and make a decision every single time, it's going to take a long time to make any decisions. Using the tools at your disposal is kind of what you should do. If you just take a Kubernetes cluster, for example, right? So a Kubernetes cluster can generate millions of log lines in a couple of minutes. Just one cluster, right? That's just logs, not including traces, not including metrics, just logs. You know, that's one service, for example, that's being run by that Kubernetes cluster. This leads me to the next question, which is what is the process for introducing AI and machine learning into a product feature versus adding a feature that doesn't require AI or machine learning? Before, so when we introduced anomaly detection in DPA or, you know, the uh, recommendation system in VMAN, they were solely focused on solving an individual problem, right? Um, so I think at that stage, it was an easier decision that, okay, we have a query response time. How do we find if a query response time is normal or not normal, right? So they played around with a few different things in built logic. And at the time, it was felt that maybe we need to start putting some form of machine learning algorithms into the product. So Solowin's created three or four algorithms that were specific to that use case to solving database query response time. A very uh, focused approach to a very specific problem. Now, if we think about the current structure of our products and the Solowin's platform, then we are kind of approaching it from a different way. So we are pre-building machine learning services. So we have a machine learning team, our teams even, and they are creating different services for us to utilize. So for example, forecasting, anomaly detection, so on. So they're creating them, they're continuously refining them, they're changing algorithms, add, adding algorithms, you know, giving more flexibility in terms of the algorithms, they're testing them for different metric types. For example, to forecast something like CPU isn't as easy as forecasting something like uh, disk space usage. For disk space usage, we can accurately forecast up to probably 95%, maybe four or five weeks ahead. Whereas CPU memory and these more ephemeral entities, for these, it's harder to forecast further ahead. So maybe four or five, six days, you get some form of accurate responses. So you have to understand what we're trying to achieve. And then you have to do all of the machine learning testing, all of the experimentation on the algorithms and on the data science side. So that is a, 
a new field and that's just a, a sole function that, you know, AI ops services, machine learning, data science. So they're their own kind of unit and they're continuously refining how they do things and the services they can provide. Then as service users, we can connect with the team and say, look, this is a problem such as alert correlation. How do we use your service to give us a more refined correlation? And then we start the conversation with, with those guys. Then they may do some separate streams of experimentation specifically for our use cases and figure out if we're using the correct algorithm or if there's a better approach. At the same time, from our engineering perspective, we're trying to solve the problem in a inbuilt logic way, right? Once we finish our experimentation and figure out which gives us the best results, because obviously we're solo ones, we have lots of really good data sets that we can, you know, use to test um, to get accuracy and to see which approach is better. Once we understand which approach is better from a data science, from an experimentation perspective, then we decide to either go down the machine learning route or down the inbuilt logic route. So it's pretty cool that having a platform approach means that any products, any feature can technically utilize the service. So for instance, let's say I'm, uh, I want to monitor websites and I'm like, oh, it'd be great if we could see, you know, response time anomalies for websites. Oh, great. There's a service there for that. We just have to build an API to connect into it, right? So that's the new approach. You have the service there, it's available to consume, and then you figure out if that's appropriate for your use case or not. I want to make a quick tangent. I promise it'll be quick, I promise. But it's a callback to stuff we've talked about in the past. Well, and something that you said earlier, Derek, right? It's hard to not see AI splashed everywhere lately. We've had a hard time having episodes that don't include talking about AI not for lack of trying to be creative and find things. But one of the questions that always comes up when we're talking about AI and the ethics of AI is jobs, right? AI's job is to quote unquote, replace the work that we're doing. Um, and some people take that as replacing them. But what it's actually doing is changing. And we've talked about this too. It's changing jobs. You just mentioned teams, right? Diff several different types of teams dedicated to creating, supplementing, enhancing the AI. In fact, we have an AI PM. It's just a fun thing to note. And someone who works directly in that field, talking about the several different teams means that jobs are just changing. AI is not taking things away from us. It's making the mundane uh, go away in many ways. And then just adding fun, complex job roles to create new AIs. You know, when the printing press was invented, you were able to produce a book in a day, right? So print a book in a day, whereas beforehand you had scribes who were, that was their lifelong dedication and it took them years to complete a book. Some scribes lost their jobs, I assume, or had to train as something else or, or whatever, or maybe they just became more niche, right? You know, when the, the mills were brought out, the Luddite movement was burning down mills because they're like, oh, we're going to ruin our jobs or take our jobs. It didn't. It just made things more efficient and it created more jobs, right? So AI, sure, it's going to take some jobs. It's definitely going to take my job anyway as a product manager, right? But, you know, what it does is it allows you to be more efficient. So obviously working with engineers on a daily basis, you know, some something like soft co-pilot, these types of things, you know, instead of spending all that time and trying to figure out where your bugs are, you know, to accurately identify where you need to make your code more efficient, it's doing it for you automatically. So then you can actually focus on solving problems, not just having clean code and making sure it's common is right and you know that you're using the most appropriate methods and stuff like that, right? Um, it just makes things more efficient. And there potentially are some roles, some positions that may be somewhat manual that could be replaced by AI. Maybe it'll improve some customer service jobs, make them it's quicker for them to identify the solution or, you know, it is going to replace jobs. But for me, it will make certain jobs more meaningful and more creative. I think creative is a key word I like to take away from that. Now I'm allowed to focus on innovation because it's doing the boring work where a human error is possible uh, that I would normally have to spend hours on, not spending hours on innovation. Completely. From a solutions engineer perspective, right? A lot of the time is spent doing demos for customers, right? Imagine you had a very smart system that could do really, really smart tailored demos, not just the inbuilt logic ones that we've seen over the years, you know, where it's really, really smart and intuitive. And then as a solution engineer, helping with issues customers are facing, help them to interpret the data, to identify issues. You know, it's just, it just gives you so much possibilities. You know what I mean?
I met a guy in the airport there last week, a friend of mine, and he's a very niche radiologist and has to look for certain things in images a lot to identify certain illnesses. And for him, as a medical profession, just being able to save hours and hours and hours a week where he's just like studying these images. You have AI, which can understand it, identify patterns immediately, alert you to something very, very quickly save time you know we know all healthcare systems around the world are probably slammed at the moment there's just not enough doctors there's not enough nurses there's not enough consultants there's not enough specialists and this isn't going to get rid of nurse jobs it's not going to get rid of specialist assistants you know any of these roles what it does is it just makes things more efficient it shortens the queues that people have to wait to get medical attention it's just going to make things faster more accurate but again it's the human will always have to make that final decision right sure it's going to be inaccurate here and there but like is it going to be as inaccurate as a human is? Probably not. Uh, I saw something yesterday about um, self-driving cars and it said that one of the barriers to actually real self-driving isn't how accurate it is or isn't, is the liability of the company that delivers it. In the US, in I think last year, there was 45,000 people killed on roads, right? So if everyone went to self-driving cars and there was only 10,000 deaths per year, that's a humongous improvement right but it's still 10,000 lives and there should not be any lives lost on the road so the car companies could demonstrate yeah with our self-driving cars everyone's on them now it's all smarter but there's always going to be that liability so there's always going to have to be a human that actually makes the final decision they have to have a human to pin this on it can't just be pinned on some anonymous algorithm right you reminded me of two different things that I read about semi recently, one of which was like yesterday, I think, where someone was using the Apple Pro headset and they were using it in their self-driving car and they were being chased by police for like miles and miles. It was the self-driving car thing brought that to my attention of like they're calling it like the future of work and all of this. And it's just like, but no, you still need to be able to. The proof was that you still needed to be a human making the decision following what you just said, right? You still need to be able to make that decision because the car wasn't stopping on its own for all these police that were chasing this person, right? You still have to make a decision to stop or to do things. And they still make mistakes because, as we know, all good AI is only as good as the data that is based upon. So it can only make good decisions based on what it's using. The other story that I was remembering was from your healthcare conversation, which was very insightful and very interesting. I read a story about a robot that they had developed in a country in Asia, and I don't remember which country, but it was originally developed to like distinguish from bagels and donuts. And it was, that was like their whole goal was to, that's all they were going to do. And it ended up being able to detect whether there were cancer cells in a person. And it was just like, that wasn't what their intention was. And this just proves kind of technology is iterative, right? We're always learning. And the technology that we've gotten over the years, you mentioned the printing press and like all of these things I've used cameras as an example when we've talked about this in the past of like they replaced paintings and we still have jobs we still have to learn how to maintain these things the assembly line is another great example of that right like it replaced a lot of jobs but it gave you different jobs instead like there's still things that humans need to do we still need to be able to do those things and i like that you said allows us to do the creative things as well right we should be using it to process data and do all this main data i don't want to stare at spreadsheets and databases and just flat data all day long that sounds very monotonous and tedious and boring and if i could get something that would troll that data for me gigabytes and terabytes and petabytes of data for me and tell me any insight into it that then i could go oh i pinpoint this time frame or something. Now I can look at a subset of data instead of like petabytes of data. That sounds like excellent win for me. <laughs> okay, I promised it was a it was a short tangent, and we've enjoyed the veering quite a bit. But uh, it's it's such a relevant topic, and I don't think that one should ever be ignored if it's ever fully understood what the ethics are behind you know how AI is quote unquote replacing things. But I appreciate you both humoring me there, but. Maybe I can reel us back into uh, the AI ops side of things um, and something, Derek, you and I had talked about that you wanted to express, I guess, your opinion or thoughts on was the considerations that go into choosing when to add to on-prem versus cloud or, or how to make that decision. So when I joined a team, most of my experience be it in telecoms and then in SolarWinds was on the on-prem world. So that's a self-hosted where customer has the software installed on their own premise or it could be cloud, but they're hosting it themselves. They're, they're paying for it. And when I 
came into the team and we were talking about anomaly detection for the on-prem world, the architecture, the solution was based on cloud-based service. So the first question I had was, why can't we do this on-prem? And it was a very obvious question. And there had been many, many months of debates about this and redesigns of, you know, what we now see as, as AI ops and solo ones. And then I slowly began to realize as I kind of understood machine learning a bit better was the amount of effort and work required to keep your algorithms accurate on the on-prem world where you're upgrading every quarter or maybe once a year, twice a year. It's just not impossible, obviously. Nothing's impossible, but it's just incredibly difficult to keep it accurate. Now, that's a kind of a strange comment. How do we keep an algorithm accurate, right? The algorithm is the algorithm, right? The algorithm is a mathematical equation that's chewing on data and it's spitting out results, right? The problem is machine learning is a process whereby it's never static. They're more informed. So machine learning is the machine is learning. The day you deploy an algorithm is the day it's at its least accurate. It is always getting better. It's always learning. It's always getting more accurate. It's only getting more accurate because we're continuously training it. Okay, so it's like you're going into Kung Fu. The day you get your black belt, can you get better? You've reached the top. You can't go, you know, your third Dan black belt in karate, which is, I believe, the highest belt. You can still get better. So everything and all is continuing to get better. It can continue to get more accurate. You know, you have to treat it as a living thing, right? So you have to make sure it's always getting appropriate data, appropriate to the use case, because you can use one algorithm for hundreds, thousands, millions of different use cases. So if you can imagine observability or SolarWinds Orion or HCO or SolarWinds Observability Swole, we have systems in place that actually monitor and maintain our algorithms. We manage those systems. We continuously monitor how an algorithm is working. We always take the results. We test them against training data. We test them against other data sets. We obviously, a lot of this is done automatically, but we're there, we're sitting there we're continuously refining the algorithms. We can change the algorithms and we can update the algorithms. If you're an on-prem customer and you had some form of machine learning sitting there on-prem and you update your system once a year, then there's 12 months there that your model, your, your algorithm can become less and less accurate. It's called model drift, right? So just the model doesn't necessarily give you the appropriate responses based on the input. So we're continuously refining it. And sure, you could have it on-prem, but the customer would potentially have to like have some form of update on a daily, weekly basis, right? So there's going to have to be some connectivity to the cloud. The fact that it's cloud-based too means that we can not just optimize it, but we can improve it and we can just rip it out and replace. So in V1 of our anomaly detection on the hate show, we use a particular algorithm. And this took into account daily seasonality. Very, very accurate for daily seasonality. We had been playing around with different algorithms and we found a newer algorithm that was uh, better and it could take into account almost a month's worth of data. So that would give us what's called weekly seasonality. So we can take into account those occurrences every two weeks, every three weeks, every 25 days. And we were able to basically swap out the algorithm overnight to V2 and customers didn't experience any difference. The accuracy of their existing anomaly detection didn't change. It was all seamless. We're in the process now of V3, which is going to be a step up again on V2. And this will have a more appropriate algorithm, potentially longer periods of time. So all of this stuff can be done without having to update on the customer side. There's no change required. We're obviously consuming the cost of this as well. You know, we're not charging an extra license or there's no extra line item on, on the SKU for machine learning or for anomaly detection or all the other features that are there or that will be there. And the cost of running a machine learning service is <laughs> extremely expensive. So one of the barriers to entry for some people from a observability perspective, especially if you're talking on-prem, is the total cost of ownership. So the hardware that you have to buy to run something. So take the most expensive component of a HCO deployment which is typically the SQL server. You have to pay for a license and you have to give it a lot of RAM and, you know, has to be really well managed. Imagine that in a, you know, twofold, threefold, maybe fourfold. That's the type of system we're talking about when we're doing machine learning. Obviously, depending on the amount of metrics we're throwing at it and the number of nodes that you have as well. But it's unbelievably expensive. So by taking that cost away from the customer and then 
by us having control over the algorithm and making sure that it's always as accurate as possible. And again, being able to rip and replace better algorithms. It just makes sense from a, a deployment perspective why we went with cloud only. Now we have on-prem um, and on detection for DPA, but it's really smart, but it's really use case specific. It's query response time. Okay, so that's a easier thing to accurately predict and for you not to have model drift. But we also have a number of different algorithms that I can switch between there as well. You know, it's extremely accurate because it's such a narrow, narrow use case. And because of the query response time, in terms of the uh, scale of data that's sent to it, it's it's way lower than from a massive observability system. Right, because what we're talking about, like if we're talking about the anomaly-based alerts, for instance, I mean, it's based off of five different metrics, uh, I think. It might only be less than that now, but I think that's the goal is for the five golden metrics to all be included in that. So it would need to be, by default, way more robust than that if it's only doing query um, tuning. Yeah, and like while it's golden metrics or a subset of, of metrics, it's on every type of entity, servers, network devices, virtual machines, you know, and then there's for your virtual infrastructure, you've got extra metrics again. So it's potentially millions of metrics per user, right? It's large scale. Perfect segue. Um, ignorant question again. Uh, anomaly based alerts. I mean, I can make my own interpretation based on the name, kind of like Derek's brilliant explanation of what is AI ops. Well, I could say, well, it's probably alerts based on an anomaly. But the anomaly is the cool part here, right? Because the anomaly is it actually using its AI and machine learning stuff to to determine what's an anomaly. And then uh, that's my deduction. But if you if you would please, Derek, expand for us. Sean and, and Chris, you're definitely, definitely fully aware of this from talking to customers for years and years and years. There's probably three things that just have been apparent since I started working with monitoring tools in, in general, right? Is one, how do we sift through the noise? Two, how do we tie things together better? And three, can you help me to find the issue and to fix it? So there are kind of three things. The third one I, I always call the easy button, right? Do it for me, right? So that's one that's still, you know, difficult one to do. It's closer, definitely, but uh, I'll leave that one off for now. The alert storm one is probably the easier one. You know, I could have 500,000 interfaces in my system. And I have an alert that says, alert me when interface utilization is higher than 80%, right? I could get 50,000 alerts in a day because there is extra traffic. It could be an all hands meeting where everyone's online at the same time or something simple. Or everyone's like watching the Super Bowl replay at work at the same time from the same service provider, right? Or in our side of the world, watching the World Cup or rugby or soccer, it doesn't matter, right? So there can be a big increase and it's... Maybe not normal, but it's not something we should worry about. So how do we identify alerts that should actually be alerts? So how do we just say, look, these are all triggering here. They're all saying they're high, they're bad. We need to look at them. How do we just say, you know what? Just show me the ones I need to see. That was the problem. And we obviously worked on it for years. We brought in certain things, dynamic thresholds on, on Orion, which definitely helped things. And then some other bits and bobs, which helped without a doubt, but didn't go far enough, right? So then we started to talk about anomaly detection and machine learning. How do we use machine learning to reduce the alert noise for customers? And machine learning was absolutely the right way to go. It was the only way to go. And what we're doing essentially is we're identifying normal operating range. So what is normal? That's what we're, we're first thought. We're saying, look, this is normal. And we're sending that normal to HCO all the time right? Continuously being sent. And we have a three hour sliding window. So it's always being updated. So we're always looking ahead three hours for what is normal, right? It's obviously changing based on real time information, right? But it knows the last month's worth of data for that particular metric. That's a separate training stream just for that one metric for that month, essentially. And it's continuously saying, look, this is what we expect to the next three hours to be. And that's always looking ahead. So we know what normal is. If anything outside of normal occurs. So if a metric that we're ingesting is outside of normal, that's an anomaly. Now, we don't always want to be alerted on every single anomaly. If a CPU normal operating range for Monday at 10 o'clock till 12 o'clock is 10 to 30%, that's the expected range for the next three hours, right? Then 
what if the metric is 31%? That's an anomaly, right? It's outside of the normal operating range. But do we care about that? Absolutely not. So with our anomaly-based alerts feature, it's understanding what the normal operating range is for the next three hours. But we're also, we also have the ability to tie in a static threshold as well. So we're saying if CPU is anomalous and it's greater than 80, then trigger the alert. Now, people say, but then why don't we just use static? Why don't we just use greater than 80? And I'll say, yeah, we can do that. But think of it this way. If the expected range for CPU from 10 to 12 today for whatever device is 85 to 95%. Great. If we just go back to the static threshold, it's greater than 80, that's going to flag. But that's not something that we need to worry about because it's expected. So we're saying if it's anomalous and greater than threshold trigger alert, it's showing the value comes in at 92%. Most people will go, oh my God, we got to do something about this. But we know that's expected. Right, so that's why it's so smart having a static and anomalous um, detection within the one alert. And then what happens is, let's say, for instance, the anomaly detection service is unavailable. Now, it doesn't matter. We have that three hour bu buffer right where we've looked ahead three hours. But let's say there's an outage where we do have no internet connectivity. Then the alert, if we have set the static threshold over 80, will still trigger even if we don't understand what the normal op operating range is. So you have a kind of a a fallback and a safety measure. Anomaly detection is fine, but from our experimentation, we found that anomaly detection, everything is anomalous, right? There's so much stuff is anomalous because it's not expected. And you could be reducing your alerts by 60%, but you're still getting that extra 40% of alerts that you don't need to see. By adding in that static threshold and tying it with the anomaly detection, then we're getting those alerts down to 1%, something more, right? So you're really cutting out the noise. So that's how we've kind of come up and, and solved that problem of, of alert noise. From years and years of talking with customers and working in customer environments, we get an alert every single day in that 10 to 12 window because it was at 80% or 85% or whatever, versus with the anomaly detection, then they can say, well, it's, an, it's not anomalous at this time every day, so I won't get an alert. Imagine people paying attention to your alerts again. That's all I'm saying. People live in alerts and it's just so hard to clean it up and I can't leave unread emails in my inbox. So, you know, it, it just, I'm seeing 10,000 alerts. I'm like, it, it's just driving me crazy. Like I need some way of, and you can't just mark all as red, you know, delete all, you know, it's just not as simple as that. So we need to get appropriate alerts to stuff that we actually need to address. And I guess this, this leads me on to the second kind of major feature that I've been involved in on the HCO side of things, and that is alert stack. Alert stack goes that step further to try and solve problem two, which is how do we pull things together and logically group them based on dependencies or some form of relationships. You can do some very rudimentary relationship management or, you know, parent child type of stuff, but we need something that goes a bit further than that. That's a bit smarter. We know that HSU has really smart topology information already. Um, it really understands the, the connectivity between different elements within an environment. So to build on top of anonymous alerts, we built an alert correlation tool. Now, the cool thing about this is that it does not re it require connectivity to the cloud. It is all done with inbuilt logic. So this is a decision we did. So we experimented with machine learning. We experimented with inbuilt logic. And this was a prime example of something that did not need the big flashy machine learning badge on it. And what it does is it uses HCO topology to understand relationships. And if an alert is triggered, now that can be an anomaly based alert, by the way, so that integrates into this feature. So if any alert is triggered, the system looks into the entity or the node or whatever element owns that alert, goes back 30 minutes in time. There's a sniff around the relationship to see if there's anything that is somewhat connected or related to that. And if there is, it checks to see if there is any issues with it. It could be a change event. It could be an alert, an anomaly alert. And if there is more than one that are somewhat connected, it will create a group that we call a cluster. This cluster is a living and breathing thing, and it's continuously updated with the uh, current status of those change events or alerts. It stays open then, and it listens for other alerts that come into the system that are somewhat related. And it appends them or adds them to the group or to the cluster. So the cluster gives us this time series where we can see 
when things started and you can see the history of how things have impacted other things all the way in a lovely little timeline as well. Um, the aim of it is to identify a potential root cause. It's not going to say it's it's root cause analysis, but it allows us to see the knock-on impact of a particular event, should be a change event or from an alert. And then we can track changes throughout the, the lifespan of that cluster. But we can see it in one logical place. Instead of having 100 different alerts where we're flicking between the alert, alert detail page, looking at the map, looking at the, the no details page, it gives us this one time series to view everything. And then we go a couple of steps further where we've integrated it with ServiceNow and also uh, Solo and Service Desk. Imagine that cluster and it has 50 different nodes, entities, servers, hosts, whatever, and it could have 250 different alerts. Imagine the ability to see all of that in one logical ticket in Service Desk or ServiceNow. That's what we've done. We've enabled the customer to easily create that ticket um, on a one-to-many basis, so many contained in the cluster so one cluster creates one incident and it's a more logical place to manage it when we look at the cluster as well you know one of the use cases again going back to my example a while ago that i can't leave unread emails in my inbox it just drives me crazy so having that use case of the customer okay now we've got alert stack where we can see the all the elements logically contained how do we then clean up my alert view so we can close a cluster or we can update a cluster and that can acknowledge all the alerts contained within that cluster. And you can add a comment in there just to tell the team this is part of cluster one, two, three, four, and we've solved the issue. So we're just really, really trying to minimize the time that folks spend managing alerts, looking at alerts and trying to figure out what's connected to what. So there are two of the major features that we've been involved in. There are more. I could talk for another two hours about other features and functions that are coming or that we've built. And again, the alert stack doesn't require any particular license. It's not going to cost you anything extra. It's all built into the product. And the adoption has been phenomenal for alert stack. Like if people absolutely love the feature and what it does for them and how much time it saves for them. I think what it does for them, you just said that is it's kind of a perfect way to look at it. Because when, when you're talking about these features, all it's doing is, and we've said this throughout, making our lives easier, right? All of the data is still there. You could correlate it yourself. You could acknowledge, or as Crystal said, just leave that email because we know it's an anomaly. Or we could just make it a smarter system to not put that in my inbox because I do know that it is an anomaly. Um, so it's really cool to see all these things as what we had said when we were talking about it. It's there to free us up so that we can be creative, so that we can be innovative, uh, pay attention to what matters. Okay, uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to, of course, get our rapid fire questions in, Derek. So we're going to shoot you some questions and just give us your answers. They can be uh, super quick one word answers, or if you want to tell us a little bit about why, that's cool too. Um, so I will ask one that I ask everybody, and it is Would you rather travel to the past or the future if time travel was an option? Going back into the past for your own lifespan would be for sentimental value. And I always feel that. You know, if you've been to a place or you've lived in a place and you have great memories of the place, it's typically because of the people. So you'd be going back just to feel that fun or that thing again. And I think that's a bad thing. I think memories should probably just stay as memories because I think they're better as memories. Okay, you could go back further and, you know, change the course of history. I would probably say go to the future. And is it too you know, win the lottery into that. No, it's not. It's just to give me a bit of a, you know, a heads up of what's coming down the track. And so I can start thinking that way because, you know, things change so fast nowadays and you can be left in the past very quickly. So, yeah. If we were colonizing a planet and you had the opportunity to move there, would you? No, because you couldn't surf or snowboard there. There we go. <laughs> There's a nice, quick, brief, rapid fire response. I uh, like it. I'll give you another rapid one. Um, and I haven't used this one in a while, but when it comes to taste, flavor, sweet or savory, what's your preferred? I am always a sweet tooth, so it's got to be sweet. Uh, anything cake related is is my cup of tea. And speaking of tea, I take honey in my tea, so everything's sweet. All right, let me ask you one more. And this one's one of my favorites that someone else came up with. If you could give yourself any talent, right, something you wish you could do today, Maybe it's because you don't have the time or maybe it's because you've tried and you're just, just really hard. If you could give yourself a talent, what would it be? 
I'm going to give you an answer that's um, it's going to come across as cheesy, but I'll give you the history to it. Like when I was a kid, I, w- I was terrible at art, really bad drawer, but I really wanted to be a good drawer. So I used to buy these books, how to draw cartoons. And well, I didn't buy them, my parents did. And I used to just like really try and force myself into being a good artist and to be able to draw. But I was just useless. So, you know, what I learned from that is I don't need to be the best at something or not. At. Like I'll give you an example. I love surfing and I'm a very average surfer and I've been surfing for a long time. If someone said to me tomorrow, you could be the best surfer in the world, you could be as skillful as Kelly Slater. So I'm going to say no, because like the enjoyment is the effort you put into something. It's not just clicking your fingers and and being amazing because if I click my fingers and I was as good as Kelly Slater tomorrow, then I would go surfing, I'd go over to Hawaii and get stuck into some big massive tubes and it would be great. But then like, how am I going to progress? You know, it's all about progress for me and getting better. I started playing golf last year. I always said I would never play it. I was like, nah, golf's not for me. And then from, you know, being a father on the sidelines of a, a football match and meeting a guy from school that I was very friendly with who talked me into coming in and playing golf with him and, you know, talking to my wife and us kind of saying, you know, it'd be great if we could uh, join those retirement groups that go play golf in Spain, you know, this would be great. So let's start playing golf. So there was a couple of different reasons to why I started playing but I started playing and I'm terrible but I'm enjoying the process of getting better not that I have a huge amount of time to put into it but I like trying to improve and I like trying to get better at something so if I could be the best or better at something in the morning like let's say golf if I was as good as Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy in the morning then I think I would have lost years of enjoyment and you know the enjoyment of actually getting better and improving a little cheesy, but I'd say noble. I'll take noble. Noble is better than cheesy <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Yeah, it's about the journey. Yeah, 100%. I think that attitude, though, that you just expressed is like you want to do the learning. That experience is more valuable than just having the skill is why you're succeeding in the tech industry. That's, I mean, we're, we have to constantly learn and iterate. That's all part of being in tech. And when you get bored of something or when you need to learn something new, it's great to have the attitude of I want to go learn you know we're we're lucky our generation and the generation that are coming you know if I think about my parents they were in jobs in the same company for 35 years right doing more or less the same thing and it's not that they weren't smart or to say weren't uh, you know high achievers or anything like that it's just that was the way things were and you just stuck at one thing and you did that for your life um now, if it's a, an art or a craft, like anything from being a painter to a baker to whatever, that's different because you're continuously innovating, right? But for for me, technology is allowing us to stay in creative roles that are allowing us to continuously innovate. And it could be something really, really simple, like changing, you know, if you work in, in sales and you've got a CRM and you find a better way of forecasting using your CRM, like that's innovating in your job. That's, you know, being creative. So we are lucky to have the ability to be creative in our roles and to be creative every day. Well said. Well said, sir. Uh, Well, this has been really enlightening. You know, we talk about AI constantly. It's so fun to get to see it from different angles and especially because I'm a part of SolarWinds, Crystal's part of SolarWinds. It's cool to hear from someone inside uh, how SolarWinds is doing this, right? The thinking behind it. So, So Derek, I really want to extend a big thank you to you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been great. And thank you, listeners, for joining us on another episode of Solar Winds Tech Pod. I'm your host, Sean Sebring, joined by fellow host, Crystal Taylor. Uh, if you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe and follow for more Tech Pod content. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.